Are we ready? We're good. Welcome. Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask you to please take a moment to check that you've turned your cell phones to uh, the silent mode so we won't have any ringing phones during the lecture. And please remind me when I sit down to check my phone. <laughs> so thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Michelle Napierski Prancel. I'm professor of sociology and the faculty director of the Women's Institute at Russell Sage College. And on behalf of the sociology program, the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies and Russell Sage College, I'd like to welcome you to the 33rd annual Hoffman Lecture in Sociology and Social Policy. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us virtually from a remote location this year. It's very exciting. This evening's lecture has been generously endowed by a gift from Linda Rosenfield Hoffman, Russell Sage College class of 1962. It is also co-sponsored by the Women's Institute at Russell Sage College and m and Bank. Because of Ms. Hoffman's generosity, our sociology program has had the wonderful opportunity to bring a long list of distinguished scholars, activists, investigative journalists, and others to campus. People who are researching and exploring important social issues and raising our consciousness at the same time. Our speakers have not shied away from weighty or controversial issues. They've talked about social inequalities, racism, sexism. They've looked at immigration, migrant worker exploitation, school shootings, the death penalty. They've looked at genocide and war. They've looked at intimate partner violence and juvenile justice. And tonight we're going to look at global peace. A list of some of the most recent um, lectures are on the back of your program this evening. Tonight's lecture begins a very busy week of important events and programs centered around peace and social justice. These events were planned to coincide with tomorrow, the United Nations International Day of Peace. And so I'd like to personally invite you to the dedication ceremony of our new peace poll on the Troy campus. The dedication is tomorrow um, at 1 p.m. in McKinstry Courtyard. And we ask that you gather at 1250 a few minutes early so that we can begin the, the event with a moment of silence and join the global peace wave. There will be an international moment of silence tomorrow at 1 p.m. The event will include prayers for global peace and also remind us about peace in our own lives and at the local level. And we'll conclude with some celebratory Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So we hope you will join us. And then tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. in Bush Memorial, um, the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies will be hosting Dr. Federica Bindi once again for Pizza and Perspectives. And that's tomorrow in Bush at 2.30. And we hope that her deep understanding of global issues will really help us to better understand um, and listen to her thoughts and perspectives on Afghanistan. Women's to make campus resources available to refugee families. And there'll be announcements in your email for about those events as well. This year, we are honored to welcome Dr. Federica Bindi, Director of the Foreign Policy Initiative at the Institute for Women's Policy Research in Washington, DC. She leads a network on women's leadership and one on internationalization of higher ed. And we are proud to announce that Dr. Bindi is also the Women's Institute first affiliate scholar. And we're honored to have her here this evening. And we're honored in the sociology program to have her give the Hoffman Lecture in Sociology and Social Policy. Professor Bindi holds a PhD from the European University Institute and has published eight books, including Europe and America, The End of the Transatlantic Relations, The Foreign Policy of the European Union, Assessing Europe's Role in the World, and the Frontiers of Europe, A Transatlantic Problem, just to name a few. And she's currently working on a new book about women's leadership. Professor Bindi has been a fellow at prestigious academic institutions such as Brookings Institute and Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Bindi has also held a number of policy um, appointments in government, including serving on the, as a fellow in the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee under Senator John Kennedy. John Kerry's chairmanship. 
Dr. Bindi has also advised four different Italian governments and several international organizations, including the European Commission, the Council of Europe, and OAS on issues such as foreign policy, international trade, post-conflict re reconstruction, and women's leadership. And occasionally she is act as a strategic consultant for international organizations, NGOs, businesses, and political leaders. The list of Dr. Bindi's accomplishments continues, but in the interest of time, I'd like to give the opportunity to you to hear directly from her herself. So without further ado, please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Federica Bindi to Russell Sage College. Thank you, Dr. Brzezinski, also because if you continue, make me blush. So, <laughs> and you know, under the, under the mask is not really. Um, okay. Of, of the Women's Institute, it's a tremendous honor. I was giving a tour this morning. It's such an amazing place. And I'm like, why didn't I know places like this before? I went to university, right? And it's, it's such a honor and I hope to be able to be involved and help as much as I can. So um, the topic of tonight is it's European, European way to pay. There, a, it's there. What? It's there a European way to peace? Question mark. You know, it, it's not correct. I will probably answer to Today, I don't really know. But um, let's go a little bit in order. So first, I will talk a little bit about the pro why the European Union came to be, because this is strictly linked to peace, and the approach of Europeans to world affairs, peace defense for the good and the bad. And, and then I will go to higher education, and you'll hopefully understand why soon. So first of all, does anybody know when the European Union started and why? Yep. Okay, it started after World War II. As you may know, for those who study history, the European continent has seen a long list of wars, century after century. And in particular, failure of 1648, it was decided that there would be sovereign states and the sovereign would control everything within the state, including the resources. So the discovery of America is pretty much linked to the fact that the Portuguese and the Spanish wanted to find the new resources, right? Resources were the most important thing. Now, what are the most important resources today? Who can tell me? What? Yep. Oil, another one, which you give it for granted, but it's soon not going to be. Yep. Water. Today it's oil and it's increasingly, it has been oil until now, it's gonna be water in the way forward. The next wars will be about what access to water. Huh? It, after World War II, who knows what were the major resources? Coal, you just said, and steel. Lucian, coal and steel of it, Thank you. 
Better now? Right? Now, France had control over the part of Germany which bordered with it, and which includes Southern Ruhr, which had coal and steel. And they really didn't want to give it back to Germany. And the American administration was like, okay, that's enough. You have to give it back. We can't afford to have a divided Germany even more divided in the moment that Eastern Germany is already communist and we had the whole communist border to deal with. Our next problem is the communist part of Europe, not Germany. So the French are like, eh. And a man called Jean Monnet came with the right idea. Now Jean Monnet was not to be confused with Monet, the painter, was the son of a family who brew cognac which is a very peculiar French liquor. And he wasn't particularly good in school. So his parents sent him to Britain for two years to learn English. At the time, the lingua franca was French. As a Frenchman, you don't learn English because you speak French. A little bit like Americans today, right? <laughs> so, but he learned Amer French, the English, and then he came over. And he traveled over Canada and over the United States. And it was particularly, he was fascinated by what he thought, right? Then he came back to Europe and World War I started. And like most of his countrymen of the age, he wanted to go to war to help his country. But he had some, whatever, health problem. They didn't allow him. So with his experience in the US and Canada on the back of his mind, he was 25. So the same age of some of you or very older and went to see the foreign minister and said, Monsieur, you got it completely wrong. The way you are, you are cooperating with the UK is highly inefficient. I've seen how the states cooperate in the US and we have to change approach. And the foreign minister didn't say, okay, kid, thank you, go. He said, he listened to him. And he actually sent him to the UK to organize a better revitaillement, as it's called in French, a better cooperation between France and Britain, which war historians say it shortened the war by two years. And after that, he was named, that he was part of a negotiating equipe who negotiated the League of Nations and was named the Deputy Secretary General of the new board League of Nations. Now, anybody knows why the League of Nations failed? Yep. Oh, yep, but also because they were, well, the case of Mussolini, they were also allowed to veto. So if someone didn't like a decision, they would either veto or exit. And there is no use for something like that. Right. So he learned that lesson. He went back into private business. He, you know, went back into cognac. Then he went into banking. He lived in, in, uh, in China, in Japan, again, in the United States, where he became a friend with, uh, to be uh, President Franklin Duran Roosevelt. And then when, uh, when war struck again in Europe, France and Britain asked him to go to Roosevelt and convince him to enter into war. Because remember, FDR did not want to join war again, right? So Monet did that. He did help convince FDR. And then he also helped transform civil industry into military industry because the U.S. didn't have a strong army at the time, all right? And then he went back to Europe. It became part of exile government in London and then in, uh, French government in London and then in Algiers. And after World War II, he was put at the head of a reconstructing unit in France because the European continent was like psh, destroyed. And it is in this position that we find him when France is faced with this ultimatum from the US and say, that's enough you're going to give Sarah Ruhr full sovereignty back to Germany. And so Monet went to Schumann, which was the prime minister, 
who hailed from Lorraine, the part of France which border with Germany, and, and talked to him and said, look, it's not about the territory. It's about the resources. Now, as long as member states, governments, national governments in Europe will control resources, we're going to have war after war. We need to change completely approach if you want to secure peace. We need to share resources, pool resources. Now, if any of you, we said water, if any of you is a scholar of Middle East studies, it would be like telling Palestine and Gaza Strip, including Gaza Strip and Israel to together manage water, which is number one issue at the end of the day, right? It's huge. It was huge. You have to think that those generations has been fighting each other for decades, right? When I started teaching, which I'm afraid to say is a quarter of a century ago, I was teaching an overseas program in Florence and I asked my students to go to, there is a market near, near the, the study abroad program I was teaching at and I asked them to poll people about the Germany. And the older people are like, uh, can't trust the German, right? And as soon as the age came down, this sentiment was less and less there. But these people hated each other and killed each other. The Nazi have done atrocious things. Right? So pooling the most important resources in order to ensure peace was huge. And luckily at the time, Europe had leaders who were not afraid of polling. They're not afraid of their, what their people would think about their policies. They knew they had to take responsibilities. They also shared many of them a common heritage because as I said, Schumann was from Lorraine, Adenauer, which was the German chancellor, was from Southern Ruhr. Um, the Gaspari, which was the, prime, the German prime minister, had been part of the Austrian diet before he became Italian. So they all spoke German. They all were part of a middle European culture. And Schumann responded to mon régime of mon affaire. I'm going to do it. So they negotiated the very first community, which was born in 19... Was un, it was announced in 1950, was born in 1951, the European Colon State Community. This is how it started, right? And it was a huge success. And just to give you an idea of how Europe were, was at the time, they decided to use a headquarters, Luxembourg. Now, does anyone want to tell me why Luxembourg of all places? Never heard. Exactly. <laughs> Why Luxembourg? Anyone want to guess? No one? Eh? It's near France, yes. So Paris was out partially because they already had the OECD and it was a French proposal, so it didn't really look good. The founding countries were France, Germany, Italy, and the free Benelux country, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. So why Luxembourg? because it had a free standing available building. That was Europe in 1951, right? Uh, that was, it was a huge success. The British said we're not interested and you know, with Brexit we saw they were actually not interested, but it did work really well. Coal and steel production rose, prices went back. It was one of the elements, one of the main elements which allowed Europe to reconstruct quickly. And then the next problem was defense. And because Germany didn't have an army and Monet said, let's use the same method. Let's create a European army. But this time there was a change in government and French government divided. The Italians were wishy-washy, you know, always the last to, to sign up. Let's wait and see what happens with the others. And, and the vote on this new treaty was stopped by the French Assemblée Nationale, the French Congress. And therefore, military, army, defense became a taboo in Europe for decades to come. 
It also has to be said that the Europeans, the Western Europeans were part of NATO. The Eastern Europeans were part of the Warsaw Pact. So at the end of the day, it was convenient. You know, the Americans provided security. The Europeans didn't have to, to worry about it. They only had to obey and they could fund their social state. You know, how, would we have had social security the way and free health and free education the way we have if we had to pay defense? I don't know. But certainly the two sides benefited in, a very, in very different ways. Right? Which meant the Europeans had to rethink their engagement with the war. We don't really have defense. We only have two nuclear powers now, one, because the UK has exited the EU. So what do we do? And we have former colonies, right? Don't, don't forget that several of the European countries had colonies. Decolonization process was strong in the 1960s. It really ended in the, in the 1970s where the last remaining colonies was Portugal, in a way, Hong Kong, if you want. And, and so we needed to have a relationship with them. And it was convenient to use the European framework and to create a principled foreign policy, a principled aid to development, devoted to human rights, devoted to democratization process. So lots of money, a lot of money, but with very strong string attached. You can get all the money, but you do, you do as we say. And despite this, or maybe because of this, it has been very successful. Do you have questions up to here? Although I have a feeling that it's very successful if you look at it from the European perspective. Because if you look from the former colonies perspective, I don't think it brought the, the wealth and the growth that you should have. You know, the Europeans like to say it very, was very successful, but was it really? Was it rather a paternalistic approach that actually damaged the country more than it helped them, right? That's a huge question mark. And we can go, if you want, into this today when we're, when we're seeing China getting into the area. But fast forward, no, from the European point of view, things went well until when the Berlin Wall came down. And that was unexpected. I was in a room probably 10 times as big as this. I was a foreign student in Sciences Po in Paris and things had started to move the Eastern side. We'd never gone unless you were a communist. And then the party brought you to Eastern Europe. You'd never seen Eastern Europe. We had no idea. It was like a real wall, right? And, but things seemed to be moving. So every Thursday, Sciences Po organized this conference by Alfredo Serre. And we would bring all together and we would command facts. And, and Grosset was about to finish his lecture, say maybe in 10 or 20 years, communists will end. And that was November 9, 1989. And in that moment, Les Apparateurs, which are the door men in Sciences Po, rushed in and said, we just came to tell you that the Berlin Wall fell down. And I was like, wow. Uh, it was huge. I still today get goosebumps. It was huge. Huge, the end of an artificial division. You know, a, a continent finally reunited. It was huge. But of course there were plenty of problems. And I won't go into the details here. I will if you want in the questions. But what really happened, I mean, in short, what happened is that the Europeans, the Eastern European expected the Europeans to just say, yes, join us in the EEC. But the EEC is like, it's not like a federation like United States, but in certain areas it's even more advanced. It's behind from a federation, constitutional federation point of view in several areas, but in other areas we're even more advanced. So becoming a part of the European community as they were called at the time, you know, it really comes with lots of strings attached. You know, they're financing, there is legislation to be implemented. It was complicated. It was complicated. So the process was low. It unnerved everyone. 
And, uh, and the Clinton administration jumped on this frustration of, of Eastern Europeans and enlarged NATO, which was a huge mistake. Now, make no mistake with Afghanistan, NATO is brain dead. Huge new building, completely useless. It's like, psh, goodbye, NATO. NATO had a counterpart, an adversary, which was the Warsaw Pact, right? The moment the Warsaw Pact was sold, did it make sense to have NATO the way it was thought, the way it was designed? No, it didn't. But the Eastern Europeans were eager to enter in some sort of Western alliance. And so, you know, this division among the Europeans, division about Europe and the US started slowly to creep in. And I think they're all emerging now. They emerged during the Trump administration, but even more so now with Biden, because the European expected Biden to be their friend. And, you know, what French president said the other day, this, I mean, not the French foreign minister said, this is something that Trump would have done express their anger, the surprise of Europeans who, whoa, the world had changed and they didn't notice, it. They, they had not noticed it, right? So it, it led to a lot of, uh, of problems and the Europeans, you know, they never reflected on the fact that the US was providing Europe defense. They, the Trump years were a wonderful opportunity to say, you know what, we're gonna create something European, maybe something small, something that makes sense, opportunity lost. There was a State of the Union the other day, the, the president of the European Commission was all over about, oh, we're gonna create this, we, we never create anything, right? The Europeans are so deeply divided on this issue for these 20 years of divide and, and conquer, right? So is there a European ways to pitch? In military terms? In developed terms, there is not. But there is a European way to peace, and that is called higher education. Why am I saying so? So when, right before the end of the, during the time of the, of the end of the Berlin Wall, Europe had to do an upgrade. And one of the upgrades, which was brought slightly before, slightly before 1987, but then grown afterwards was higher education. So as Europe was creating so many more policies, they realized that they needed to bring in education. Why? Because Europe had mobility, free mobility. It was called free mobility as workers. So, but if you are a worker, say you're coming from Sicily and you work in Germany, you want your family to come and work with you, right? But if the, your wife is a homestay mom, if your kids are in school, that was really complicated. But even if you managed, you know, my friends from Belgium, their dad worked in Italy, you know, high-end migrants, you would call them luxury migrants or expats. When they went back to Belgium, they had to repeat one year because the system didn't talk to each other, right? So it was decided to change the word workers with people and to create education policies. And this, by all means, has been the biggest success. I told you before I went to Paris. So my first dream was to come to the US, but there was no internet, right? I had no idea I could get a scholarship for skiing and come into the US. My parents simply laughed in my face. You know, mind you, the cost of education back then was not what it is today, but still from a European perspective, I think I paid $200 a year. And even those were waived because I, I had excellent grades. And so, you know, it's like, why spend in the US? So. No US, but one summer over my first year, I, I was in Paris to perfect my French and they passed by Sciences Po. You know, you're young like you are and you have no shame. So I knocked on the door and I was like, hi, I'm here. I love what you do. I wanna take your classes, what can I do? And they were like, where are you from? So, ah, from Florence, I go to political science there. It's like, ooh, your school was created by ours. And we had this new thing, Erasmus, and you can get, a scholarship and study the whole year here. Go and talk to your school. And I went back to my school and like, I want Erasmus, I want Erasmus. I bugged everyone, right? And my father saw I was restless. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna help you get another scholarship meanwhile. So finally I got my scholarship and I have two scholarships in Erasmus. I was the first Erasmus from my own school. I was in Paris, 
with plenty of money from a student perspective, of course, it was best time, best year of my life. It was amazing. And I was like, okay, when I came back, it's like, where do I go now? Norway, giving me a scholarship, here I come, right? But at that time, in the early 1990s, I was really a white fly. And my friends were like, huh, Erasmus? And who's going to cook for you? I was like, well, I'm going to intoxicate myself a couple of times, but I'm going to cook for myself, right? Today, all my students go at least on one or two Erasmuses. I have several of my students, many of them, who get double degrees. I have students I advise for their, for their thesis in, in St. Petersburg, in Paris, in all over, getting double degrees. When I was hired by my current university, University of Romtor Vergata, to, in the year 2001, it was to help the director internationalize it. We had very few agreements. Today, we are super internationalized. I said, our students study all over, get double degrees. That is in less than 20 years. So once I was interviewing in a very good university here in the US for Vice President of International Relations, which is someday my dream job. And they're like, oh, we have five international partners. And I was like, whoa, you have five international partners? <laughs> and I'm like, so, and it's not only that you go on Erasmus, is the mixed families, as you would call here, them here. You know, it's for every student who leaves, there is a whole family. There is a whole circle of, of, um, of, uh, of people who get affected. The place that was mentioned before where they did my PhD, the UI, European University Institute, when I did my PhD, was the only international PhD in Europe. And statistics tell that there were more babies, at a certain point, there were more babies born than PhD defended. That was changed at a certain point. But uh, today, every PhD is international in Europe. As, I'm, as I was touring around, around here, you know, I was debating among myself Part of me really wants my son to have an American education, a top American education like the one you have. But parts of me are also like, am I going to deprive him of something? A truly international experience in Europe. I mean, he, eventually he will decide. But this has changed. My students, they, their minds is never crossed by the thought that the Germans are bad or other people are bad. My students are naturally open-minded and international, right? And this is because in a small office, someone 30 years ago thought we need to invest in education and was able to convince the European Commission. And this was, in my opinion, the huge success. If people know each other, if people know that differences, a difference of language, it's fun. You know, one of the fun things when I went back to live in Brussels is that, you know, during the course of a day, you can speak all your languages. You know, I can speak to someone in Italian, with someone in English, I can speak French, I can speak Portuguese. I, it's, I can relate to the cultures. So if you know the difference is okay, you're never gonna do war again. So in some, yes, there, there is a European way to peace. But this is not what we would normally think. The European way of pe to peace is higher education, which is an amazing gift the new generation got, and even the older ones. Thank you very much, and I look forward for your questions. So I'll walk around um, with the microphone and. Um, for, and so raise your hand when you have a question. And then we just ask with the masks that it's important for you to um, uh, hold it very close to the mask. So okay. did you have a question back there? Oh, and I forgot to mention too. We are also monitor, monitoring the chat on the virtual um, presentation. So if you have a question, you can submit it to the chat 
and we'll be able to um, answer it for you or read it for you. So, yes. <laughs> so questions. So the people online can hear you. Hello? Okay. Okay. So um, do you guys, do you think that having kind of like a global currency option would be like a good step towards peace around all countries? The problem. Secondly, we do have global global currencies nowadays in uh, crypto money and, and things like this. But the uh, currency is just a mean, right? And, and also a common currency like we have in Europe, it's a lot of work. It's great because it's absolutely great. I mean, we can now, when I say that we are more advanced in some areas, you know, we can travel around, never change. I don't need to change my license. I don't need to change my phone number. There is no roaming across countries. We don't need to change currency. I can open a bank account anywhere. So, but um, it's very convenient, right? But I'm not sure that would really do anything on world peace, which, which is really access to resources. Okay. And resources change, by the way. Dr. Bindi, when you were talking about wars being over resources like um, oil and water, I kept thinking about how much corporate control there is over water, like a Coca-Cola or Starbucks. How do you see that playing out in terms of um, control and peace and war? It's, it's going to be catastrophic. This is something ever really, I ever started teaching 25 years ago, I always thought it would be the next war and is happening. And I don't think people realize it yet. You know, my other love is alpine skiing. And I was talking to a ski resort and I was like, we really need to be start thinking in Colorado. And I live in Colorado now. And, uh, and Colorado is one of those states which starts to have problem in access to water. You know, you can only build, nowadays in Colorado, you can only build in an area if you can prove you have own water, right? And there is fights already on the Colorado River, which, which brings water to, several, to several, several states. And as you also know, Colorado is a, country, a state where a substantial part of the local economy comes from skiing. Now, the way we do with ski today it's with artificial snow, a lot of artificial snow. Now, artificial snow is one of the most intensive waster of water and energy, all right? It's, and I was talking to one of the resources that we really need. I, I really wanna bring Kerry to Colorado to talk about that. We really need to rethink. There are ways in which we can, uh, we, we can uh, spare. So for instance, there is um, snow harvesting. Some countries started to do it in Europe with lots of success. So basically, and then by the end of a season, you take masses of, 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 uh, of uh, snow and you put them under, under straw and under a special white cover. And during the summer, you only lose 15%. So when you start, you can just put it away. Just, just use that. Um, we can create a system to recycle water. You know, the water that is created, we can be refiltered and reused. We can create um, alternative ways to alternative energies, uh, renewable, use renewables for the energy that is needed to make snow. So for instance, in Tahoe, there is a resort that is completely, a small resort that is completely uh, fueled out of renewables. But there is also a large resort in Canada, Manitoba, which already announced they're not going to be open this year because of water scarcity, right? Now, as long as I'm, as for as much as I love skiing, if the only problem is skiing, we could live with that. But the problem is that we are going to have problem accessing water. And, and we can all help. You know, you take a shower, take a quick shower. 
right? And not waste water. You wash your teeth. I think we should all live in a in a RV or in a boat for a few weeks in a row, and then you learn rationing, right? Or camping in the middle of nowhere with no access to water. You want just think of this easy gesture. You wash, you open the water, you wash your teeth, put the water on your brush and start washing. What do you do with the water? You let it go. This is wasted water. So changing means making an effort when you're washing your teeth, close that faucet. <laughs> Open, reclose. It's, it's a small gesture, but it, change, it, starts, it changes the world. Take a shower. You don't need to stay two hours in the shower. I know it's nice, <laughs> but, but you can get a quicker shower. So we all can help and we all need to help because your generation is gonna see is gonna see a really bad word if we don't act up quick. You know that there was this report on the UN, global warming up 2.5 2.7. What does it mean? It means glaciers are melting, water is gonna go up. It's gonna be a mess. So it's it's a major issue, and we all need to put pressure. We all need to contribute our little solution, but we all need to pressure to put pressure. And I have to say, I was talking to some friends of mine, you know, uh, when we were your age, we really thought, you know, we were really idealistic, we were engaged in politics. I've been engaged in youth politics. I learned a lot. It was a lot of fun. And we thought we would change the world. And now my generation is in power and we are absolutely failing. Right? We are leaving you people a much worse world than we found. Well, older generation not helping either, helping either, but it's it's a pressing phenomena and it's going to come sooner than you think. Other questions? Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. What are some of the challenges facing higher education in the U.S. that might prevent it from this peace building capacity that you see in Europe? So um, in my mind, the number one challenge is the cost of education, which has, has reached awful prices. I mean, it's, it's beyond what an upper, upper middle class family can afford, right? And uh, so, my answer to that, and this is basically the answer I give my son, it's you either go to a very special place, which could be an Ivy or could be a place like this, where you get very individual attention. You go to an Ivy because you get, not because the education is particularly better, but because you get that step. And that step in the US means something, right? If you don't go to an Ivy, you go to a place like this, a small place, where you're nurtured, where they grow you as a person and they can give you that individual attention that it's needed for you to unfold both as a student and as a person. But any other option, it's wasting your money and time. I'm sorry for the many colleagues who teach in other places, but I've been places where kids stand no chance. Uh, I was in a place which I want to name and, and my kids stood no chance. And I decided to get out the moment in, in this particular place, we had kids who were homeless, right? It was a region respected college, but it had, and I went there because I wanted to see something very different. You know, I've always had been in DC, I've always been, you know, GW, size, AU. So I wanted to see something very, very different, right? And I did. And so this particular place we had, it was good regional college with, lots of problems for the students. And then this donor comes in and donates $10 million for the football team. And none of them goes to scholarship. And that was the time I decided, okay, I'm out of here. This is really not the place I wanna be. Because I understand football is important, bring merchandising, everything you want. But you get $10 million and it's not moral to give it all to football. 
your job as a chancellor or the president or whatever is to convince them that, you know, yes, half of it can go to football and they will still hugely benefit for it. But the other half goes to scholarships. The other half goes to helping the students that need it the most. And this is what fundraising should be above all. And this is what I understand you do here, you know, looking for money to help students. So the reality is that education is widening the gap in the US. It's also a fairly complicated system, right? So take my case. Yes, we are immigrants about to become citizen. We have been what you could define luxury immigrants, even if it hasn't been a journey without bumps and difficulties. I'm a university professor. I've been at several universities. I still have, I speak English fluently, uh, I still have difficulties at times to understand how the system works and how to best advise my son. So think that, you know, first generation kid whose parents have only studied maybe two years in school and don't speak the language. You know, they don't even understand the, the importance. I see that even back home in Italy, for instance, in, in the mountains where I live most of the time where I am, you know, it's such a gap. You know, if, you, if your parents have not gone to school, you're likely not to send your kids to school. The difference is what? The difference is that in, in Europe and in places like Italy, yes, the difference between what you will be earning is not huge. You know, even if you do a manual job, you'll still get by. You have free education, you, you still have free education, free healthcare, cost of life is much lower. But in a place like this, you know, there is a monetary implication whether you have an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree, right? So access to education in my, in my field is huge. And then the other thing I see is, as I mentioned before, the world has gone on. I mean, if you look at the internationalization rankings, the first is MIT, which ranked 37 or something in the world, MIT. Right, so Asia and even Europe are way ahead and, and the US is lagging, is lagging behind, which means that uh, kids in many colleges are not given the tools to understand the world, right? And this is why kind of education you have here is so important because they really stimulate you and help you understand the world. Remember that two thirds, maybe more, four fifths of what you learn in college you will forget the facts, right? But what you will remember is an approach. It's how to understand, how to critically interpret facts, which is even more important today because with social media, we tend to get like-minded news, right? So another thing that you can do to have peace is actually, if you are a Democrat, follow some Republican groups on Facebook or vice versa. Not because you like them, but because if you don't, the algorithm is never gonna give news which are somehow different from your point of view. And I know, you know, some people you really hate and I'm like, ooh, liking them, I don't wanna do it. You have to do it because you have to confuse the algorithm. You need to see things from other people's point of view, right? So it's, um, the, the one difference I see it's, President Biden is embracing COVID to put a lot of money into the system and to bring the US next to the next century. The Europeans from their point of view are way behind. So there are opportunities, but you know, it remains to be seen how these are gonna be seized and used. Other questions? First of all, I want to thank you for your talk. And um, I, I have a question about, um, we've got a lot of students here tonight who may be interested in gaining a more European perspective on global matters, on peace, and, and thinking about these issues. Uh, what would you say would be ways for these students to further their engagement with these kinds of discussions? Yeah. 
So I, I don't even know if I have a European perspective anymore. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I, I, I use the term we or they both for Europe and the US. <laughs> Not probably we for both. And uh, well, first of all, be involved in the community. I mean, what was really useful for me, as I mentioned before, was to be in youth politics. We didn't have in, in, in Europe back at the time, we didn't have clubs, we didn't have, you know, really didn't have any opportunities. So the opportunities for us were youth parties. But my suggestion is be engaged in school, volunteer in NGOs, take leadership roles in small groups, because you know, leadership is hard. And if you take leadership in a small project, you will understand what it means to be in that position and also what you need to do to grow and be a, bet, a better leader. So use any possible opportunity. If you can study abroad, that's very important. If there is one thing you wanna invest, if you have one thing you wanna take a loan for and, and invest on is study abroad. And please don't go in those programs I used to teach at. You don't want to go, you know, frankly, it's wasted money. It's wasted money. I am never going to be successful in my quest to become a vice president or vice president, whatever, for international relations, because I strongly believe it. And most universities only do this kind of, of things. Study abroad, it means that you attend a university in the local language or you go and work with kids in the local language. You get out of your comfort zone. You go volunteer with school in Guatemala you know, you, whatever, but you have to get out. You have to get out of the country, out of your language, out of your comfort zone, however that comes, right? If you go to my hometown in Florence and you attend the program I used to teach in, that's not study abroad, that luxury travel paid by your parents, right? It's and parents are happy to send people there because then they're gonna visit them, right? But that's, I mean, yes, of course, it will have an impact. I'm not saying that it won't have an impact, but it won't have as big as an impact to exit your comfort zone. This is what really makes you change, right? This is what really gives you a different view and approach to life. And if you don't get that approach to life, then you're never gonna make an impact in, in the world. So do whatever. It can be formal, it can be informal, but save a few bucks, and you, you can travel on a shoestring, right? There is interrail. You can get, uh, for I think $500, you can get a ticket for a month all across Europe, backpack, sleep in hostels. For 10 bucks a month, at night you can sleep in a hostel, meet people from all over, right? So there are much cheaper options, and, but do it. Do it, especially if you are afraid of it. Right? If you are afraid of it, that's exactly the reason why you should go. And we are all afraid. I was afraid when I went to Paris. I, I was afraid when I first came to the US. I stopped being afraid when I moved with my family. With, I had a son and that was more important than anything else. So moving with my little family was completely alone, but all the previous 20 years I went around alone and there is always, element of fear, but there is also excitement because something new is gonna happen, right? Do your own, to save money, do your own research, you know? You wanna volunteer somewhere? Just write to the priest, to a, in, say, write to a priest and say, I'm coming from the US, I wanna come and volunteer one month. Can I do it? Don't pay to do that, you know, do, do it in a meaningful way, but exit your comfort zone, that's, and exit your language. Speaking a foreign language is, I think, the most important thing because only by speaking a language you can understand the culture. I'll give you an example. When I lived in Norway, I conveniently dated a Portuguese guy. Probably it was, it had a reason why living in Norway, I was dating a Portuguese guy. But anyway, at that time I didn't speak Portuguese. So we spoke either French, or Spanish, which I knew a bit, but perfected talking with him, right? And in Norway, they're very precise on time. So even the way the 
time is told. So it's what, what time is it? It's five to seven, right? They would say the equivalent, it's tempo. They would say it's five to seven, right? Which means you are ahead of time. In Italy or in Portugal, most of people would say 8.55. Now in here, you see I'm already Americanized because I said it the American way, right? <laughs> 855. What does it mean? Why saying 705 or 855 makes a difference? Because it means your head is on front or behind. If you are invited for dinner in the US, you're supposed to come on time. If you're invited for dinner in Italy and you arrive on time, you're really unpolite because your host won't be ready because you know that you're supposed to be late, right? In all this, I was in this culture where if you say, 7.32, you are there at 7.32, and if you're 33, you are unpolite. And my Portuguese boyfriend would say, I'm calling you later. Eu ligo-te já, in Portuguese. I'm calling you later. And you know, living in Norway, eu ligo-te já, okay, you're gonna call me later. So I was like, <laughs> biking back to my door, but <laughs> and standing, you know, we didn't have cell phones, and standing in front of a phone. And of course, Antonio would not call me já, is já in, it would call me hours later, or maybe the day later. We broke up. Really? <laughs> and then, and then I go to Portugal and I learn Portuguese. I understand that in Portuguese, this ja is not later in Norwegian way, which is in an hour. It could be in an hour, it could be in two, five, a week, a month, a year. Right? I was like, gee, had I learned Portuguese before, I would have still been with Antonio. <laughs> so learning the language is important because it gives you access to a culture. So that's the best investment you can do. And to be frank, there are ways to learn language almost for free. You know, you can watch movies in original language and with subtitles. That's what I did before I went to Portugal. I did took some classes, but then I listened to a lot of Portuguese TV and I didn't understand much. But then when I got there, it really helped me. So it's of course taking classes help, but even listening to the radio, that's, that's what I do to keep my, my languages alive. You know, I, live, live, I listen to language, to programs on the, on the, today with digital radio is so easy. You know, I can listen to digital radio in every, language I speak, not really Norwegian, but uh, the rest I do and, and, and keep practicing, right? Keep learning the language, use every opportunity I have to speak in, the own, in one own language, right? So I'll put answers. Others, we have a um, few more minutes for another question. Is there any questions from online? One last question. Who offers the last question? Hello. I was wondering what role do you think national nationalism will play moving forward in history? Unfortunately, we're going back in history, right? And uh, and we have seen a number of leaders playing on the nationalist, on the nationalist issue. And um, that is, is scary. I mean, I'm not saying that being, have national pride is, is a good thing, right? Italians are not, have national pride when we won some sports events. Now this year we have won, it's, it's crazy because the government is putting a lot of very stringent measures, but we have won every possible sport event. So people are like, yeah, we won volleyball, women and men and this and that. So they're just happy, right? That's good nationalism, right? But, um, but in most cases, nationalism, it's, 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 really, it's really bad. I mean, what scares me most is Chinese nationalism, also because the Chinese reason on completely different life cycles, right? They are an empire. They perceive themselves as an empire, but it's an empire that was able to, well, being a dictatorship somehow helps. They can plan years in, a, in advance. 
even more than the Russian are able to do. It's like, and, and what is happening there, the rearming, it's, it's scary. This is what freaks me out the most. And also what freaks me out is that the Europeans are really not seeing it. You know, this ACOS thing should have been a wake up call for Europeans. You, you know what this ACOS thing is? It's basically, it's an alliance between, just came out an alliance between the UK, the US and Australia. And, and the only thing that the Europeans took out of it is that Australia canceled the purchase of normal regular submarine for nuclear submarine from the US. And they're angry about that. And I'm like, hello, look at the larger picture. There's something going on there. You have to wake up, right? And, and they're not. And uh, I do hope I'm so wrong. I never hope. Yep, go ahead. It's, it's not that he's preventing, uh, he's asking about the International Space Station. It's not really, it's a question. So what, what happens on the International Space Station is that we have joint research, okay? And which means we share a lot of data, even with the Russians. Because remember that despite lots of rhetorics, US, Russia, blah, 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 there are fields where the US and the Europeans are working hand to hand with the Russians and International Space Station is one of them. And, um, and the Chinese do not want to share their data and they would have access to the other's data. So it's really a problem of sharing data. And, um, and uh, they're now building their own International Space Station. Let's see if they manage. The next question with the International Space Station is Russia, which has also threatened to leave, but that is purely an economic issue. Because until, basically until a couple of years ago, the only way to go up was with the, with the, Russian, with the Russian rockets because the shuttle was out of commission, right? So everybody would go up with the Russians, which was a huge economic benefit to their space sector. And now that you have uh, SpaceX and other private providers, for the Russians is much less profitable. So they're threatening to exit just to, to make their voice heard and get larger share of, uh, of the flights going up. But this is gains. But at the, at the basis of the China thing is access to data. And I have to say COVID has not helped because with COVID, clearly data has not been shared the way it should have been. Can't really give specific, but the, I have proof that the Chinese knew way before they shared uh, government, direct government sources. So they knew at the very least, at the very latest at the end of November. And they didn't share that data. And that, and I have a suspect it was done on purpose not to share the information. And with the expectation that the US would have succumbed. This I'm telling you the word of a very high Chinese official to someone I highly trust. They warned this person that I think it was 2nd of December, the war 19, 2019. They warned this person that something huge was gonna come, which would make even the 2008 crisis look nothing. And that would have destroyed the US and the US would have had stopped thinking they are the worst superpower and do whatever they want. And this person was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then he made a report and said, you know, I got, I don't really know what he's talking about. And then all of a sudden, a certain point, he connected dots. And, and things didn't work the way they thought, because actually, I think COVID is, has been, is going to be beneficial for the US in the long run, because the US, differently from Europe, has the ability of making debt and pumping money into the system and investing on the infrastructure with a very, very, uh, yep, you have a question? I'm just finishing, one sec. Lacks 
definition of information on, on infrastructure. I actually think that COVID is beneficial to the US because it's gonna launch it into the next century. Yep, the current century. Hi, we have a question from one of our online audience members, Christine Ward. What role do you see the recent immigration surge in Europe and the US playing in promoting a more tolerant world or is it that even possible with the nationalist mindset that seems to be growing on both continents now? Okay, I hope I understood the whole question. I think both continents are shameful, right? For a continent like Europe that has sent immigrants and then conquered, you know, continents and killed, slaughtered local populations that are now a crime because we have a few more immigrants, it's super shameful. You know, out of the whole Afghanistan thing, the only thing Europe came out, you know, got out of it is like, we don't want more immigrants. This is beyond shameful. And same goes for the US. You know, it's, I'm not saying, you know, super open door or whatever, but immigrants are a strength. They bring diversity, they bring they bring uh, different perspectives. They bring more force we need. And this fear of the different is, is frankly shameful. And, uh, and we have the resources to have them, right? The problem is that if you get the immigrants and you put them in camps, like we do in Lesbos in Greece, or like we do in Lampedusa in Italy, and you close them in camps in conditions that can hardly be defined livable, but rather awful conditions. Of course, trouble comes out of it. Doing nothing because they're doing nothing. I had a student who just defended a thesis on uh, tracing the story of a Syrian girl from escaping from Syria with her uncle, aunt, all right, and going to going to Lesbos, and then eventually now they are in Holland. It took them several years, especially to her, to get to Holland. And during this year, she had no access to education, no access to anything. Right? This is shameful on us. It's really shameful on us. And uh, and uh, you know, again, going back to the beginning of, of, of my talk today, we. You know, we talk about both Europe and the US like to say that we have a principled foreign policy. Our policies are guided by democracy, human rights, and blah, blah, blah. That's not true. That's not true. If you look at the numbers, these are small numbers, which we can absolutely absorb, absolutely help thrive, you know, giving them access to education, to health, language classes and, and so on and so forth. And we're not doing it. And you no, know, it's and, and and the worst part is that nobody cares. You know, very few cares. The others are like, yeah, okay, they're in the camps. As long as they don't come in and, and touch me, I, I'm happy. It's so sad. Nothing has changed, you know, coming from Italy, they were the Italians coming and being confined in Ellis Island because they had scabby and things like this. And, and a century has passed and we're still treating immigrants in the same way. That's, that's not fair, that's not good. If they're escaping is because they can't stay in their country. That, that's the thing that people don't understand or don't want to remember. If someone is going to live in another country it's usually because they're looking for better opportunities, better opportunities that they can't find at home. And in most cases they're missing their home they miss their families, they miss their traditions. Takes a while, even, even, even myself, you know, it took me 13 years to finally feel at home in here. When I finally got to Boulder, I finally felt at home. 13 years, almost 14. And I speak the language, I used to visit the US, I came clearly not as a refugee. It's, it's a process. And we can help that process by helping people, you know, which in the US also means trivial things like access to credit. 
access to credit is a nightmare seen from a foreigner point of view. You know, we have been living in the US for 13 years and basically only the last three years count. I'm like, ew, it took me like five years to get a credit card, right? And again, I was earning good money. We had good jobs. Again, my husband, I actually got the credit card when my husband became a diplomat. And then they gave him a credit card and I finally could get a credit card as well. As a wife of the diplomat, as a fellow of the Brookings Institution with a regular, with a regular salary, I could not have a credit card. I could only have a debit card. Why? Because I never borrowed money. Duh, <laughs> I just arrived. So they are very practical things that makes very hard to immigrants and needs to be fixed and addressed. All right, thank you very much for bearing with thank us. You. Thank you. And Dr. Bindi will be back tomorrow at 2.30 to share her perspectives on Afghanistan. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening and thank you, Dr. Bindi.